Pyongyang, Yang, but they will also worry that at the end of the day, that kind of strategy has not dissuaded the North Koreans from carrying out tests in the past and may not do so this time. All right, Simon, Simon Marks there in Washington. We'll see Simon again later for more developments out of the United States. Now on to uh, South Korea in uh, Seoul, where Yun Suk is standing by with us tonight. So Yun Suk, we heard the North may be using highly enriched uranium for the first time for this third launch. How far do you think Pyongyang will take it? Well, you know, if you look at the statement from North Korea, it did say that it would be launching satellites and rockets and also conduct a high-level nuclear test. Now, this is where the government officials and experts here is saying that they think North Korea is referring to a nuclear test using a highly enriched uranium. Now, when North Korea conducted nuclear tests in 2006 and in 2009, plutonium was used. But North Korea had hinted in 2010 that it had enough highly enriched uranium, and that is what it could use in this third test, um, which would give North Korea a second way to make nuclear bombs. Um, and so that is the biggest concern here right now. But, you know, North Korea has not said when it would do it. There are some analysts and government officials who say North Korea can do it within a few days if it wanted to. But then there are also others who say that North Korea will want to use this nuclear part as long as it can and, as, you know, to try and get as much as it can out of Washington and so before it gets ahead with the nuclear test. Okay, Young, so you know these threats, they, they aren't exactly new. So, you know, how, how is this latest one different from those in the past? And, you know, what else or what other signs will the region be looking out for this time? Well, what I can say, Glenda, yes, they're not new. But there are some elements who are looking at the statement and saying that the wordings are very strong coming from this young, new leader, Kim Jong-un, who many thought would be more open to reforms and would be very different from his father, Kim Jong-il. Now, if we look at the North Korean statement, it says that the nuclear test will target against the U.S., the sworn enemy of the Korean people. And then it goes on saying that settling accounts with the U.S. needs to be done with force and not with words. And it's these kinds of wording the language that many South Koreans hear are saying that it is very different. It's very strong coming from the um, from North Korea directed towards the United States. But then, you know, we also have some saying, you know, it's the same rhetoric from North Korea, um, that North Korea is just really trying to get, get the attention of Washington and South Korea. And if you really think about it, um, you know, in the last four years under the Obama administration, North Korea has been ignored. South Korea's um, even Obama administration has had no dialogue with North Korea for the past five years. And so because this is, in a way, a first statement from North Korea, um, North Korea is trying to get a strong message across to the United States and the international community. All right, May, thanks there for that update. Uh, South Korea correspondent there, Bureau Chief, rather speaking to us from Seoul. Territorial feud at the heart of rising tensions between China and Japan is in focus again tonight. A boat carrying Taiwanese activists to the disputed islands in the East China Sea turned back before reaching its destination after Coast Guard vessels from both sides fired water cannons at each other. Well, the activists set off for the Japanese-controlled islands uh, at around midnight. They were hoping to place a statue of the goddess of the sea on the islands, known as Senkaku to the Japanese and Diaoyu to the Chinese. Well, Taiwan also claims the islands. The group had to abandon the plan after being blocked by Japanese Coast Guard vessels within 17 nautical miles of the Rocky Island outposts. Well, the incident comes at a time of growing regional concern over the intensified standoff over the islands between China and Japan. Both Beijing and Tokyo recently scrambled fighter jets to assert their claims to the area. And in September, more than a thousand people in Taipei protested against Tokyo's decision to buy the islands from their civilian Japanese owner. All right, let's get the latest now from our Taiwan correspondent, Victoria Jen. So, Victoria, how significant is this move uh, to, to, uh, to hand it towards the islands? Well, um, it, it is about time that Taiwan makes some noises over the issue because this is the second attempt by Taiwanese fishermen to try and land on the Diaoyutai Island since September last year after Japan nationalized three of the islands. Now, during this four-month peri uh, four period, the Taiwan government did little to assert its claim, while China and Japan were busy sending fighter jets. So 
So many Taiwanese are growing impatient with the government's inaction, and some decided to take the matter into their own hands. There may be more protests like this in the future, but they will be closely monitored and kept under control. That's because given Taiwan's current political and economic situations, it cannot afford to mess up its relations with China and Japan, which are not only the two major powers in the world, but also the two biggest markets to Taiwan. Tim? Okay, Victoria, the, uh, the ship, it was accompanied by a Taiwanese Coast Guard vessel. So how's the government responding to questions that, you know, this may have been an uh, organized uh, flotilla? No, you're not. Hey, come on. Well, Taiwan's oh. foreign ministry basically defended the fishermen's mm. action, saying that the Diaoyutai Islands are part of Taiwan's territory, mm. and so are the surrounding waters, which have been Taiwan's traditional fishing grounds. Therefore, the fishermen have every right to enter the disputed waters. So it's kind of a less confrontational way for Taiwan to to assert its claim over Diao Yutai without aggravating China and Japan directly. Now, the incident is not likely to have a major negative impact on Taiwan's ties with Japan. But Japan has hinted that the protests may delay their bilateral talks over the fishing rights in the Diao Yutai waters, which are already originally set for next month. Linda. All right, many thanks there, Victoria, speaking to us from Taipei. Well, despite uh, the row between China and Japan over the islands, there is optimism that as long as the lines of dialogue remain open, tensions can be resolved. Well, our Japan Bureau Chief Michio Ishida has this report. The tension in the East China Sea was one of the areas of concern at a conference hosted by the Global Forum of Japan. Speakers from both Japan and China tried to address measures to overcome the dispute, which has deeply hurt bilateral ties. I think the most important, we should sit down to talk. That's most important. You know, we should recognize this is a dispute island. That's most important. If see, this is no dispute, how can we continue to talk? He was referring to the Japanese government's refusal to recognize the disputes in the territorial waters. This is what he also proposes for the South China Sea dispute between China, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Speakers were also keen to highlight areas of commonality, for example, in the field of energy and environmental conservation. ま、日中間様々な問題のございますが、特に環境問題というのは、え、地球全体の規模で見て、え、特に、え、開発、え、発展を目指し、え、中国の省エネ、え、そして人民、あの、国民の健康を守るための様々な環境補正、え、日本とし
And this man's asking, what does it take for him to get a Hong Kong passport, even though his family has lived in the territory for nearly a century? That's about 100 years. Well, our correspondent finds out about the problems faced by some ethnic minorities in Hong Kong. Consulate attack in Libya. Let's let's have a listen 
to one of her quite feisty response. The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? It is our job to figure out what happened and do everything we can to prevent it from ever happening again, Senator. All right, so Osama, as we know, she's stepping down in a couple of weeks, but uh, clearly not in the mood to go out quietly on this. No, definitely not. I mean, a very vociferous response there, very dramatic exchange, the kind of thing we don't often see uh, up on Capitol Hill between the Secretary of State and a Republican senator. All of that illustrative, of course, of the fact uh, that the Obama administration really wants these questions about the attack on Benghazi to go away. She says, uh, what's the point of having the discussion? The Republicans say, well, the point of having the discussion is that we have a feeling there was some kind of a cover-up underway here in the days leading up to the presidential election in a bid to prevent accurate information about what happened in Benghazi from getting into the hands of the American people. Now, uh, Hillary Clinton's preparing to leave the State Department. Senator John Kerry, in just a few hours' time, will be sitting in that very seat uh, up on Capitol Hill, preparing to begin his confirmation hearings. There'll be all sorts of questions about his attitudes to foreign policy, but the Republicans don't want to let Hillary Clinton leave scot-free on this issue, not least because they know that after she leaves the State Department, She's going to go home, she's going to rest, and she's going to think about whether she wants to run for the presidency in four years' time. All right, Simon, thank you very much for that. Simon Marks at Bright and Early in Washington, D.C. All right, let's take a quick look at other stories also making the news this Thursday. A senior Japanese official has met Algeria's prime minister to press for an explanation of the gas plant hostage crisis which ended on Saturday. But according to latest reports, Tokyo has now confirmed the deaths of 10 of its nationals. Now, that's the highest toll for any nation whose citizens were caught up in the crisis in the Sahara. A Japanese plane carrying the survivor is expected home on Friday. Meanwhile, Malaysian survivor of the crisis has been reunited with his family in Penang. Kavi Kukusami, a construction engineer with a Japanese company, JGC Corporation, had been held hostage but managed to escape. The 48-year-old thanked his government for bringing him home. Mr. Kukusami is one of three Malaysians who survived the crisis. One uh, other Malaysian is confirmed to be among some 80 people uh, killed after Algerian troops attacked the gas plant at the end of the siege. Another Malaysian is still missing. Accusations that uh, Hong Kong leader Siwa Leung didn't tell the truth about illegal structures at his home. Well, this time around, his accuser is a key Leung supporter and a Hong Kong delegate to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference in Channel News Asia's Roland Lim standing by in Hong Kong with all the details. Roland. Timothy, yes, the man in question, Lo Mong Heng, a seasoned politician who backed Siwa Leung's campaign, so the revelations are all the more shocking. Now, in an interview with the mainland magazine, that's I Sun Affairs Weekly, Liu actually accuses the chief executive of making false claims about an inspection at his home at the peak. Now, remember, Mr. Liu was embroiled in the illegal structure scandal because when he campaigned, he insisted that there were no such structures. Turns out later, there were. Now, according to Liu, the uh, chief executive lied when he told reporters last May that he had engaged uh, two professionals and a lawyer to inspect his house when, in fact, Barry Cho, excuse me, CY's campaign manager, admitted to Lowe that all three people didn't exist. In fact, the last time Mr. Lowe hired a professional was 10 years ago to inspect his home, and that man has since passed away. Spokesperson for the chief executive's office today we, uh, said that Mr. Lowe had already given a full account on the illegal structure and had nothing to add. Timothy. All right, Roland, um, another big uh, headline story today, and that is uh, Japan's trade uh, deficit. Um, you know, it, it logged a record trade deficit for last year, so how big of a task does the Japanese government now have ahead of it to revive the economy? Huge, it seems. Japan's exports fell more than expected in the month of December. Trade deficit also widened to a record high, $78 billion for the whole of last year. It is a mammoth task on the part of government to revive the economy. Remember, current, uh, Japan currently running a trade deficit of about 10% of GDP, and the government's public debt 
now stands at 235% of GDP. That's the highest in any developed country. Today's data reinforces Japan continues to import more, and that's mostly because of fuel, as it's most of its nuclear plants are actually closed out. But at the same time, exports have fallen due to a weaker global demand for Japanese products. All right, Roland, so we reported on Monday that the uh, BOJ adopted a 2% inflation target after intense pressure from the Abe uh, government. Will news of this deficit impact that decision now? Not likely to have a and to revive the economy centers on more monetary easing, keeping the value of the yen, hence the 2% uh, inflation target. In fact, just today, Mr. Abe says government looking into buying the law to Bank of Japan so that it keeps loose monetary policy until the economy is actually revived. So not likely to be any measures on that score. Okay, uh, well, despite today's numbers, are there signs of economic improvement emerging, though? Uh, yes, you, you are uh, well informed. The government did actually raise its view on the economy today, the first time it's done so in eight months. Now, in a monthly economic report issued by the finance ministry, the view is that yes, the economy is weak, but there are also signs of bottoming out in certain areas. A private consumption, for example, holding steady, and business sentiment is showing signs on improvement too, according to the government. Okay, so what else is happening in the rest of uh, the business world now? Yes, let me give you more uh, business headlines. There are signs also that the mainland economy is rebounding uh, with manufacturing activity picking. An early reading of the data compiled by HSBC show factory output accelerated this month. Its flash purchasing management index, or PMI, rose to 51.9 uh, in January from 51.5 last month. Now, remember, anything above 50 indicates expansion. And this is the third consecutive month of improvement and the highest PMI reading in two years. However, overseas demand for Chinese uh, manufactured goods remains weak. HSBC says export orders barely grew this month following um, contraction. Stock market action, uh, yet uh, the for East Asian markets, despite the positive lead from Wall Street overnight and news of the uh, Chinese uh, manufacturing activity hitting a two-year high. In Tokyo, as you can see, the Nikkei reversing early losses to close high by 1.3%. China exposed counters like Komatsu leading the gainers. Auto counters let the cost be lower 8 tenths of 1%. Hyundai Motor surprised with a quarterly fall in profit. Now, Apple missing its earnings forecast or Taiwan component suppliers taking it hard. The Thai X lost 0.6%. Investors took profit in Shanghai on the positive Chinese data. The China comes in down 0.8%. And the Hang Seng also tracking Shanghai's losses. Markets in Indonesia, Malaysia closed for a public holiday. Some corporate news now. Now, shares of Hong Kong listed Chinese sportswear maker Li Ning were suspended today pending an announcement by the company. Now, yesterday, shares tumbled more than 5% on reports that the sportswear sector as a whole faces an inventory overhang problem in China. Li Ning uh, issued a profit warning in December that it would pose a substantial loss for fiscal 2012. And back in October, former Olympic gymnast Li Ning himself said that he was selling a stake in the company to his talent agency, Viva China, for $175 million. Final one, Chinese investment banks are carrying out their biggest layoffs and cuts since the global financial crisis. According to a Reuters report, the layoffs and bonus reductions are the most severe since the, in, for the industry since 2009. Now, industry statistics aren't available to compare past job reductions, but the situa situation was brought about by regulators turning off the IPO tap in China. Now, among the banks affected, Huo Xin uh, Securities, China Merchants, and the Civic Securities are all looking to shrink their workforce by between 5 and 10 percent. And those are some of the business headlines. Back to you, Brenda. All right, Come thanks, on. Roland. And you can definitely get more business news and analysis on Channel News Asia's new business central that's coming right up after Prime Time Asia and uh, Temo Nabili standing by to tell us uh, what's on the show tonight, Temo. And a very busy show, but a couple of the high points. We'll be dissecting the Nokia and the Apple numbers, and we'll be asking, are both those companies in the past, and is China poised to take over the handset market? And, of course, it's Davos week. We'll be asking, what is the point of Davos? Why does anybody go there? 
uh, and what does it eventually lead to? All that and much more coming up in a short while. And still ahead here on Primetime Asia. New research has shown that female smokers are far more likely to die from lung cancer these days than they were in the 60s. And we do apologize, that's not the picture I'm referring to. Well, this is the accident that could have been much, much, much worse after a baby gets flung out of the car in this collision in Russia. We will show you what happened there when we return. North Korea has announced plans for a third nuclear test as well as more rocket launches, and this time aimed at America. It comes in response to tightened UN sanctions. Pyongyang's announcement prompted a call for restraint from China, which is its sole major ally. Beijing also pushed for six-party talks to resume on the North's nuclear program. A boat carrying activists from Taiwan to disputed islands controlled by Japan has turned back before reaching its destination. Coast Guard vessels from both sides fired water cannons at each other. The activists are hoping to place a statue of the goddess of the sea on the islands, which uh, is known as Senkaku to the Japanese and Diaoyu to the Chinese. Thailand's deputy prime minister and foreign minister believes it is the Philippines' right to bring its dispute with China over the South China Sea to arbitration. Mr. Surapong Tui Chachakun was speaking on the sidelines of the Singapore-Thailand Civil Service Exchange Program. And he echoed the view expressed by his Singapore counterpart, Mr. K. Shamugam. Both ministers emphasized that all parties should pursue peaceful means to settle the dispute. And Mr. Surapong says that he expects the matter to be discussed during the next senior officials meeting between ASEAN and China in March. 
In this regard, Thailand as a country coordinator will carry out close consultation with all parties concerned. So I have instructed my permanent secretary uh, as some leader to pursue the, this consultation with China, the Philippines, and other parties concerned. Every country in ASEAN decides on its own national policies, what are in its own interest, and decides uh, whether it is voting record at the United Nations or specific issues. And ASEAN doesn't seek to control national decisions. Uh, that's why you have to distinguish between a specific decision by any particular country and an ASEAN uh, decision. ASEAN's position has been set out in the six-point principles. Well, the trial of the five men accused of the gang rape and murder of a student, it has begun now in New Delhi. Security was tight, as expected, when the suspects arrived at the fast-track court where about 30 policemen blocked access to the courtroom. There is a gag order on proceedings and no immediate details have been released, but in a twist to the trial, one of the defense lawyer has disassociated himself from his client. Well, counsel ML Sharma will no longer be representing Mukesh Singh. <laughs> मुकेश के ऊपर कोई दलालों के द्वारा और पुलिस के द्वारा कि मुकेश को अल्टीमेटली वही बात करनी पड़ी जो वो पुलिस चाहती है या वो दलाल चाहते हैं और मुकेश के ऊपर इतना बड़ा प्रेशर देखते हुए हमने कल ही मुकेश को जाके बोल दिया था कि वो हमारे लिए मना कर दे हम ये मैटर नहीं करेंगे well, the lawyer also added that uh, since he's no longer representing the suspect, he would drop his call for the trial to be shifted out of New Delhi. Over in the West Bengal state, India has inaugurated its first ever all-women's court in a district of Maida amid calls for the implementation of stronger anti-rape measures. So this court will consist only of female judges and staff to be deal or to deal exclusively with crimes against women. And also stepping up on efforts to protect women is far-right political party Shiv Shena. Members are giving out thousands of three-inch blades to women in Mumbai to help them defend themselves. Local party official AJ Chaudhry told women that they should cut the hand of the person that touches them in the same way that they cut vegetables. Very controversial suggestion there. Very controversial. Well, Hong Kong is known, of course, as a cosmopolitan city here in Asia, uniquely positioned as a special administrative region of China. But some ethnic minorities face rejection when applying for Hong Kong passports despite living entire lives in the territory. And our Hong Kong correspondent, Leslie Chang, examines the issue in our continuing special series on Hong Kong's policies. 50-year-old businessman Philip Kahn was born and raised in Hong Kong. Mr. Kahn's family immigrated to Hong Kong from what's now classified as Pakistan a century ago. Uh, my family actually um, had gone through 